going to begin today with a tale of not two cities, but a tale of two bishops. So the first involves uh, the bishop of Haarfeld, Swaziland. His name is David Biedger. And he was a man not only of, he's died now. I'm sure the church killed him, but never mind. <laughs> he was a man of immense presence. He is the very definition of an Anglican bishop. And if you were standing in this room with your back to the door, you would feel him before you saw him because the hair on the back of your neck would raise and you would think, what is going on? And there would be David Bircher. He was a man of um, immense presence, uh, large in stature, but sort of larger in, in presence. So the one story I remember of him is my husband played the organ at one of his services and he had this dramatic interlude that he had trained the choir for. And you know what they did? They came in at the wrong minute. <laughs> and Marius wasn't going to have them interrupt his... So he went, shh, <laughs> carried on, and then gave a big nod and everyone started singing. <laughs> Bishop David Bircher went to the lectern and he went, in all my years of being a priest, I have never dared to tell a congregation to shh. <laughs> <laughs> the significant thing about David Bircher was that he was the sponsor for HIV AIDS activists in our area. So I trained in 2005, and his message to us on the final day was one I would never forget, and this is the summary of my sermon. So after I've said the sentence, you can all go back to sleep, and when you go home, you can say, this is what the sermon is about. <laughs> and his message was this. Are you ready? So take notes. This is the summary. <laughs> Are you listening, Margaret? <laughs> Um, holiness is utterly attractive. Holiness is utterly attractive. It seems a strange message to offer HIV AIDS activists, but there you have it. Holiness is utterly attractive. And his definition of holiness is that you leave everything and every place more. So that was the nature of Jesus. Wherever he went, he left people more, more at peace, more healed, more holy, more. So holiness is utterly attractive. That was the message. And so that brings me to my story of a second bishop. I'm sure by now you've all heard that Desmond Tutu has sadly passed away. And for me, it's significant that he passes away in the 12 days of Christmas, in the lead up to the Feast of Epiphany. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So my experience with Desmond Tutu reminded me of David Bircher's message, holiness is utterly attractive. And so this is what happened. In 2008, many of us were horrified when South Africa again was burned through with violence. This time it was xenophobic attacks. And we were aghast that our people were murdering across the country fellow Africans, refugees from states north of South Africa. So in protest, the Anglican Diocese of Johannesburg closed all the churches and we had an outdoor service of protest. And so I was invited to help write the liturgy for that. And then because all the clergy leading the service were black and they wanted to be inclusive, <laughs> I was the affirmative action white face. <laughs> An ironic twist, you might admit. So Desmond Tutu preached, and myself and uh, a black woman priest, who's now the Bishop of Lesotho, and a colored woman priest, who's now runs the Church of the Province of South Africa, 
uh, we led the Eucharist in a con celebration. And the service was in the usual Anglican panache. You know, three theorifers, crucifers, hymns. It was, it was absolutely glorious. The one change was that the children led the procession with balloons. Because in Isaiah says, the children shall lead them. So that was the one change. And all went well until the end of the service, after Desmond Tutu preached. That's how I introduced myself. Hi, Des. I'm Des. <laughs> Because our Anglican panache was completely annihilated by this huge crowd of, of Anglicans who were just trying to reach out to touch Desmond Tutu. Now, just so that we're clear, outwardly, he's perhaps not the most attractive man. His teeth are too white and too big. His nose is disproportionate to his face. He comes up to about here. He's, he's rather a short man. But there was obviously some magic about him that this whole huge crowd of, of people were trying to reach out just to touch the man, um, as if to receive some kind of, of blessing. And the Anglican procession, with panache, pomp and circumstances, disintegrated as we all tried to, tried to become security guards and you know, just to save his life, really, he was being crushed. So I was reminded again of David Biedke's message that holiness is utterly attractive. I witnessed it with my, with my own eyes, with uh, David Biedke. So I think it's pertinent that he, he dies in the lead up to Epiphany, because in so many ways, his whole life seems to encapsulate what the Feast of Epiphany means. As you know, the word Epiphany means the manifestation of light. So, we celebrate that all the nations of the world are brought to the light of Christ. So this is how it links. You would have heard the Old Testament reading, and you don't need a preacher to make the connection for you. So we, there was this dream in Zion that a holy people of God would live a life of an alternative holiness and that this holiness would be so utterly attractive that all the nations of the world would be drawn to the light of Zion. And the hope was that they would beat their swords into plowshares and learn the things that make for peace. And where we pick up the reading today, so, so well read for us, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. Watch, nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So that's where the Gospel of Matthew ties into this, this hope that a holiness so attractive would draw the nations of the world. And so that's what we see happening when the Magi come with their gifts to the king. Why gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, it says here, they brought to you the wealth of the nations. They shall bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praise of the Lord. So one of the things that strikes me is, is that as the foundational texts for the Feast of Epiphany, the manifestation of God's light to the world. I would feel that that wholeheartedly describes Desmond Tutu. In messages that I've received via email or via Facebook, it's astonishing how many people have their photograph with Desmond Tutu. There's little children just being baptised, whose names we don't remember, all the way to the Queen, to Barack Obama, and everyone in between. It's really quite astonishing. And it just speaks to an epiphany, a manifestation of light, a holiness so attractive that the nations of the world are drawn, drawn to it. 
The other element of the Feast of Epiphany is that it is a feast day that celebrates radical inclusivity. So there's a huge amount of church tension and politics tied up within this feast. Would you believe it that there could be tension and politics within the church? My shattered nerves, it was a first for me. <laughs> but here it goes. What happened is, in the West, we kind of think that the 25th of December is a good day to celebrate Christmas, and we can all come together. Now, that seems universal, don't you think? Except in the East, they exchange... ...good day to have the Feast of the Incarnation. So this feast day is almost a bringing together of East and West. Instead of just having one day of Christmas, that seems silly. Why not have 12? And everyone's invited. So this feast day represents the bringing together of the eastern and western sides um, of the church. So it is a symbol of radical inclusivity. But more than that, you can see for yourself that for the early Jewish Christians, these magi from the east, with their wisdom, wealth, and power, and their separation from all things Zion. Can you see how they represent those who are outside the story of salvation? So here, in the same way as the shepherds, the outsiders become the insiders. So it's a story of how all people, even if they are dirty Gentiles, can be included in the story of incarnation. So these magi crossed boundaries of time, culture, language, and race to discover Christ. And now they are included in the inner circle of the nativity. So that's one story of Epiphany that I'm sure you agree explains the life of Desmond Tutu to us as well. A man who crossed all boundaries in a method of radical inclusivity. And the man was in his 90s when he died. And one of his more famous quotes is that he would rather go to hell than a homophobic heaven. In South Africa, a motion was passed that priests be allowed to celebrate the marriage of gay people. It was passed in the House of Laity. It was passed in the House of Clergy. Guess what the House of Bishops did? They knocked it back. And so I get a bit knee-jerky when all these bishops in South Africa are now pontificating <laughs> at his funeral. How dare they? So he represents a story of radical inclusivity. The third story relates to power. You see, because our magi, as wise as they are, make a mistake. And the mistake is assumption. Now, there's a saying that goes, assumption is the mother of all adventures. You haven't heard that saying? Assumption is the mother of all stuff-ups. You obviously don't hang around in my crowds. So they assume that the place where you find a king is where? In a palace. So they make a huge mistake because they seek information about the Christ from the places of power. So the encounter is filled with irony. They ask the one who is born king of the Jews from Herod, who is actually king of the Jews. That is true, by the way, no matter what the door says. And, and the gospel will come full circle 
when the crucifixion begins in the court of Herod. A further irony is that Herod's court, get this, have the scriptures. The Magi don't. They're relying on stars and cosmic events. The court of Herod has the scriptures, it has the rabbi and the scribes. Yet they are still blind to the presence of Christ that the Magi can so clearly see. And that's a warning to all of us in how tightly we hold to scriptures. It's a warning to us, of, to us who hold scriptures dear. To be gentle and curious when we hold the scriptures. Herod's use of the scriptures leads to a massacre of the innocents. When the privileged, the Magi, seek salvation in the places of power, the consequences for the vulnerable are brutal. And so we had hoped that we might find truth and justice and salvation from courts of leadership, courts of power, and courts of law. But the Feast of Epiphany reminds us that God is made manifest among the least, the last, the lost, and the little. What this makes real for us is that the mystery of God's reality surrounds us all the time. God is made manifest in a house, not a palace. God's mystery is manifest in weakness and vulnerability, yet this comes as a threat to our comfort, a threat to our fear of change. Jesus is a threat to Herod. And in this strand of Epiphany, again, I see glimpses of Desmond Tutu. No matter who was in power, he still spoke truth. He wagged his finger at P.W. Boerter as P.W. Boerter waved back. <laughs> he waved it at F.W. de Klerk as F.W. de Klerk waved back. But guess what? He continued to wave it at Nelson Mandela, Thabo Mbeki, and all who followed. He continued to speak truth to power. He was not popular in Australia, by the way. At the fall of apartheid, both Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu came on a visit to Australia. And Nelson Mandela, the superb statement that he is, thanked Australians for their support of anti-apartheid activities. Guess what Desmond Tutu said? He said, look, you guys have got some mess in your own backyard, and we need to talk about that. And he wasn't invited back. <laughs> so truth to power. There is a link in the story of Epiphany between Jesus and Moses. In both stories, the slaughter of the innocent ensues. Matthew chapter 2 verse 17 describes how Rachel weeps. Moses floats down the Nile in a reed basket and Jesus is later spirited out of the country along back roads. And both saviors start their life as political refugees. The whole Feast of Epiphany is, is embellished in so many church traditions. A lot of them legend, a lot of them apocryphal, but all of them delightful. Do, do you know the, the tradition of the chalk blessing? I've done it in parishes before. During the season of Epiphany, some churches have this tradition where 
a priest comes with chalk and it's blessed and visits the homes of the parishioners during the Feast of Epiphany and does a blessing on the doorway, marking the names of the Magi, Caspar, Malchior, and Balthazar. And some of this has its roots in the German Lutheran tradition, where it says, Caspar, Malchior, Balthazar, protect us again this year from the dangers of fire and water. That seems like a helpful blessing <laughs> for Australian Christians. I remember this time last year, or the year before, I, I left the country for international travel, and I was worried when I left that I couldn't get to the airport because of bushfires. Bushfires raged through the country. Then. Six weeks later, I was worried I couldn't get from the airport back home because the entire country was flooded. What is going on? I was back at work two weeks and we went into lockdown and the rest, they say, is history. <laughs> so the origin of that prayer, again, highlights how the marginal are born against the crushing presence of power. I would end with this, that inspired by the example not only of the three magi who leave by another road, that's the hope for us in this story, is caught because by default, because of our privilege, by default, we are in the house of Herod. It is we who have power and privilege. So by default, we sit alongside the Herods of this world, benefiting from our position in society. And we sit alongside the scribes and Sadducees and the experts of the scriptures who manipulate it for their own means. So there is hope for us. And the good news is that like these magi, we can leave by another road. We can leave behind us the palaces of power, politics, and privilege. And we can choose the margins of society against the crushing presence of power we can offer the liberating power of presence feast of epiphany invites us not only to leave by another road but to shine as lights for God in the world. And like if it happened for Desmond Tutu, it can happen for each of us. We too can be that holiness that is so utterly attractive.